Hey, good morning, everybody. This is George from DinosaurGeorgia.com, battling allergies. What a nightmare. Uh, these allergies are driving me crazy. All right, let's get started. Um, Leela from San Antonio, Texas, where I live today. How many bones did you find total throughout 2008 and 2009? Leela, normally this would be a very hard question because sometimes we find a few, sometimes we find a lot, but I can tell you the exact number of bones I found between 2008 and 2009. That number is zero. <laughs> During those two years, I did not have a single opportunity to go out in the field and look for anything because I was so busy on other projects. So unfortunately, it's been a while since I've been out in the field digging and uh, I can't wait to get out there and uh, Hopefully, I'll find more than zero in the next two years. All right, Anthony from Evans, Georgia. Good day, Dinosaur George. Hey, Anthony, good day to you. If it's not too much trouble, I have a quick question. Never too much trouble, my friend. He says, I am an amateur filmmaker, and I am making a movie about dinosaurs, and I want to portray T-Rex as a caring mother. Would this be scientifically accurate? Thank you very much for your time. Anthony, first of all, it's my pleasure to help you. I'm very excited about your project. Um, amateur filmmakers are incredibly important because generally you don't have to deal with the same political nightmare that uh, some of the bigger uh, photography groups have to deal with. So uh, I'm very glad to hear that you're an amateur. Um, okay. One of the difficulties in paleontology is behavior is something that doesn't necessarily fossilize. We can find a skeleton of an animal, but we can't necessarily tell you how that animal acted. And when it comes to being a good parent, that is a little difficult, but there are definitely uh, signs there that tell us they were. We find groups of predatory dinosaurs, big ones like Tyrannosaurus rex, where it suggests clearly that they are living together in a group. One of the things that I look at is I look at modern animals as the window into the past. And when you look at a big predator, it's usually important for the big predators to live together in family groups with caring parents because normally the predators, uh, there's only, say for every hundred plant eaters, you may only find 10 predators. And what that means is if there's less, less predators, they need to be able to ensure the survival of their young. If you are a duck-billed dinosaur and you lay 15 eggs at a time, eh, you don't have to be such a good parent because, you know, one out of 15 is going to make it. But if you're a Tyrannosaurus rex and you're only laying two or three or maybe four eggs at a time, you've got to ensure that your babies reach adulthood. The number one job of an animal, any animal, is to perpetuate its genes into the next generation. In other words, make absolutely sure we're making babies today so that there's a baby maker tomorrow. And so my best guess is Tyrannosaurus Rex absolutely would be a good, loving, caring parent. And there's enough evidence in the fossil record that shows that other predators were caring. I think it's a safe bet and I think it would make for a very interesting movie. All right, Nick from Cleveland, Ohio. Hey, DG, what's up, Nick? What's up? <laughs> he says, do you think that today's conditions are suitable for dinosaurs? And if so, where do you think the conditions are right for them to thrive? Wow, what a cool question, Nick. Um, okay, one of the differences between today and let's say the Cretaceous period um, is that there's a lower percentage of oxygen. And so, uh, since there's a lesser percentage of oxygen, I don't know if dinosaurs would have been able to survive in today's environment. Now, certainly birds survive in today's environment, and birds now are scientifically classified as dinosaurs. But birds are a little bit different. I think they're, uh, uh, they're kind of like Dinosaur 5.0, a <laughs> little upgrade, have, uh, have the ability to deal with things that maybe dinosaurs couldn't deal with as far as percentage of oxygen. If it wasn't for that, uh, Nick, if it wasn't for the oxygen level, dinosaurs could pretty much live anywhere except for on the poles because they don't get warm enough. Uh, certainly dinosaurs could deal with cold temperatures, but not throughout their entire life. So really, I think you'd find dinosaurs pretty much all over the world, different species being able to adapt to different environments. All right, Matilda from London, UK. Hey, George, I'm writing an essay about dinosaur extinction theories, and I'm having trouble finding theories that are worth writing about. Could you suggest any? Well, Matilda, uh, all theories are worth writing about to a degree, I guess. Um, it just depends on how interesting you can make your, uh, make your essay. The most, I think the one that has the most evidence to support it is the impact theory. That is a gigantic rock, an asteroid from space, uh, hit the Earth right at the end of the Cretaceous period and caused such an upheaval of ecosystems that my personal belief is that that is what 
caused or at least triggered the extinction of, of um, non-avian, that is, uh, non-bird dinosaurs. Um, but again, that would be the one I would look at to write my essay. If you don't want to write about that one, if you think everybody else is writing the same one, then you might want to look at volcanism, incredible vol volcanic activity that may have also altered uh, the Earth's environment, literally globally, and cause the extinction of dinosaurs. Look at the Deccan Traps in India. Do some research on that. There's huge amounts of evidence uh, that gigantic numbers uh, or amounts of uh, volcanic activity was occurring, and that may have led to the extinction as well. Matilda also says, also, what are the problems with the land bridge theory? Why is it rejected? Matilda, I guess what you're talking about is that land bridges allowed other species to intermix and maybe causing disease that would have wiped them out? I'm guessing that's what it is. If in fact that's what you're talking about, the reason why that's not plausible is because there were dinosaurs living on islands separated completely from other dinosaurs and yet they suffered the same fate. It would also mean that if you're carrying a disease that's being carried worldwide, it would mean that that disease would have to have an extended incubation period within the carrier so that, so that it could travel great distances and infect all the other dinosaurs, and that's just not plausible. In other words, um, today, something like the flu can cause problems globally because we can jump on a jet and be to another country, and if we have a carrier on that jet, he or she could easily begin to distribute that disease all over the place in a very short amount of time. But if it were like it was before and everybody had the flu, and we were having to sail or walk to other countries, uh, by the time you got about three quarters of the way there, you would have died from the disease and you wouldn't have passed it on. So I'm guessing that's what you mean by the land bridge theory, Matilda. If it's not, please write me back and I'll try to uh, answer it clearer for you. All right, finally, Kenny from Broken Arrow, Oklahoma. What a cool name for a town. Isn't that Broken Arrow, Oklahoma? That's so cool. Oklahoma has an incredible history of, uh, of Indians, Native American Indians. I absolutely love Oklahoma. Even though I'm from Texas, I'm not supposed to say I love you guys. I'm supposed to say you're our deadliest rival. But uh, I really do love Oklahoma, and I think Broken Arrow is such a cool name. He says, hey, DG, I always was wondering, and he put always in caps, so that's why I had to add emphasis to that word. What sounds do you use to make your T-Rex roars? And if you found them, please tell me where. Kenny, that's kind of a cool question. Um, the roars that you hear in Jurassic Fight Club, um, things that you see, like the videos that I do uh, where I have a dinosaur roaring, oftentimes those are created by, we take uh, modern animal sounds, we add a couple of layers of different animals and then we enhance it with things. For instance, uh, the Tyrannosaurus roar that you hear uh, in Jurassic Fight Club, uh, I'm not going to give away all the secrets, but I'll tell you this. There is a bison, a camel, and an elephant. All of their noises are all combined together to make that roar along with some other things. Um, so we actually layer sounds of modern animals to create what we think prehistoric life would have sounded like. We have no way of knowing. Tyrannosaurus rex may have chirped like a, like a little bird for all we know. Uh, you know, the other way we can make those sounds is uh, put a tape recorder next to my bed when I have to get up early. Oh. The noises you'll hear me roaring and growling and making these noises, it's horrible. But that happens when you get older. So anyway, if you want to make your own sound of a Tyrannosaurus Rex, um, record your father one day when he gets up early and you hear all of the cracking and the roaring and the growling because that's a great way to make those noises. All right, everybody, until next time, write to me at DinosaurGeorge.com. Click on the Ask Dinosaur George page, fill out the form and submit it. Keep in mind, we get thousands of questions every single month. There's no way I can answer them all, but I do my best. For all of you on Facebook, um, nice to see you guys or hear from you guys. Uh, always uh, great getting emails from you and seeing uh, and reading some of your comments are absolutely hilarious. Take care, everybody. I will see you all again soon. And for you young people out there, make absolutely sure that you become a good reader because that's going to be very important. And for everybody, use good manners. I'll see you.